is with thinking through your priorities. What is it do you, that you want out of your career? And what do you want out of your family life? And what do you want out of your you know, one crack at your kid's childhood? And whose team is this? Is this your team? Or is this your daddy's team? Thanks for listening to Dad Mode Podcast. Common sense parenting in a politically correct world. Here's your host, Andy Carlson. Welcome back to the Dad Mode Podcast, Common Sense Parenting in a Politically Correct World. I'm your host, Andy Carlson, at Andy Carlson Show on the Twitter machine. I'm a father, and I have no idea what I'm doing, but uh, you don't either. They're squirt. Uh, so let's try and learn something together today. The website is dadmodepod.com, Twitter at dadmodepod, or use the hashtag dadmode, and we'll get at you, dog. And we're joined today by Dr. Scott Beeson. He's on the Twitter machine, at Scott Beeson, B-E-H-S-O-N. He's professor of management at Fairleigh Dickinson University. Uh, he's got a blog, fathersworkandfamily.com. And also, the main reason, the manifesto, why he's here, uh, the book is The Working Dad Survival Guide, How to Succeed at Work and at Home, available on Amazon now. Scott, how the heck are you today? Hey, I'm doing great. I'm happy to be here. Now, what did you think about the intro? Was, was it too flowery, not flowery enough? No, that's great. All right. All right. <laughs> All right so, uh, Dr. Scott, Dr. Beeson, uh, what do you prefer? Scott, about please. Scott, Scott, Scott. Yeah, right. I'm just one of those PhD people who needs to be like, you know, um, like Dr. Evil, you know, yeah. uh, he's like, you know, I, I didn't spend five years in evil medical schools. We call Mr. <laughs> evil. But um, no, I'm happy to be called Scott. I mean, uh, the the academia people with uh, the tweed jackets with the leather patches oh, on the I have this one colleague. He has 12 initial things at the end of his name. Oh, like, my God. And, and he insists on all of it, and it's it drives me crazy. And I'm like, no, please, call me Scott. <laughs> I'm just a person. <laughs> uh, uh, all right, Scott, be before we hop into the book and the various topics there, uh, why don't we get your story about you know, your profession, your you know, becoming a family man, and everything that led to uh, kind of where you are today. Sure. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm again, I'm a business school professor, and I, I teach things like um, – human resources and workplace flexibility and have a specialty kind of in work family issues. And when I started my research and study and, and working with companies on this um, about 15 years ago, so much of the work on things like work and family balance and on workplace flexibility was all oriented towards like, how do we retain working women who are dealing with this issue? Mm -hmm. um, and it always kind of struck me that, you know, hey, wait, um, Dads are parents, too, and uh, we struggle with this, too. Um, it became personal for me about 10 years ago when I became a dad. Um, so I was able to see it both from kind of a professional point of view and a, and a personal point of view. And, you know, for me, you know, listen, I'm a college professor, which is a really sweet gig. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's like 20 hours a week I need to be at a particular place to do my job. And otherwise, you know, the rest of my stuff I could do kind of wherever, whenever. And, you know... And even with me, with this really sweet gig, um, balancing work and family sometimes is really hard. Um, and I know I have it much easier than most dads. So um, basically, I um, so I you know as professor, kind of doing academic -y writing and and stuff in this area. And then um, about three years ago, I'm like, you know, this is dumb. I'm talking to the same hundred <laughs> professors who also do this stuff. Um, so I started a blog. I was like, you know, I want to get this information out to actual people who can actually use it and be helped by it. Um, and then that led me, you know, a couple years later to writing this book um, where, you know, it's kind of has, you know, it's a little bit based in research, a little bit based in what companies do and what, you know, what um, what research shows. But really so much more of it is, you know, from a from a man to man point of view, um, you know, hey, working dad, you're not alone. You know, we all care about our careers. We all care about putting in the time and work to be very involved, good dads. Um, here's some advice that can help. Um, it's, you know, and based on interviews with dozens of dads, some of whom figured some things out, some of whom really struggle, um, some personal stories and self-assessment exercises and stuff like that. Um, really trying to uh, give advice and encouragement to my fellow kind of working dad. Now, it's kind of funny that the book's coming out uh, you know, today in our society, whereas 
you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it was all about, you know, the working mom having it all, the whole Murphy Brown thing. And then even before that, you know, dad's role in the family was to take the train to the city, work right. for eight hours, take the train back, and then come back and smoke a pipe and have a cognac, and then the kids will be off to bed. <laughs> and that's it. He's the breadwinner. Right. And, and now it's uh, like gent. Uh, that's a, you know, that's also a hot button term, but gender roles are sort of shifting where uh, you do see a lot more, especially young families, where the wife can be the breadwinner and the dad is taking more of an active role in parenting. And then you also have both families where yeah, also have families where both parents are working and you know, there has to be some sort of balance in there. Otherwise, you know, both parents both get eaten yeah, up. Yeah, I mean the most common arrangement is that you got both parents working mm -hmm. um, and that means, you know, not only are you do you care about your own career, you're supporting your spouse's career, and still all the things that have to get taken care of to run a household have to get taken care of, right? Mm -hmm. um, kids still need to get to their stuff, and houses need to get cleaned, and you know the whole works. And actually, you know the research shows that dads um, today work as much as they ever have, um, but also do three times as much childcare and twice as much housework. Um, and in large part, that's due to this, you know, dual income couples. Um, and, you know, I, I know, you know, that, you know, gender roles and blah, blah, blah is, you know, kind of, um, you know, delves into kind of politically correct stuff. But, you know, the fact is gender roles like, you know, dads just being the provider and the authority figure, you know, that constrains dads, you know, and, and it, it kind of keeps us in one little box. And I think it's a good thing. That, you know, anybody, a, a, a dad or a mom can be the kind of parent that they're best at or, or that best suits them, right? And if that means being very career oriented, awesome. Go for it. Be that, you know, be that kind of dad. Just make sure your family's getting what they need. Um, but if it suits you and your style to be a little bit closer to your kids or, you know, not quite the distant authority figure, but more of a, um, you know, a hands-on, everyday kind of dad, then, then you know, we should be free to do that. And um, there's no one best way. You know, it, it should be based on what our priorities are and what our families need. Now, the the whole traditional, you know, back in the 50s sort of gender roles. Now, uh, in, in what ways with your family personally have you sort of crossed lines? Are, are you good cook? Are you good at clean the house? Right. So yeah, well, listen, my dad was a great dad and very hands-on, very involved, and I, I'd be happy if I'm half the dad, you know, he was. He was just awesome dad. Um, but there's a lot of things I do in my daily life he never did. Um, you know, he occasionally barbecued mm -hmm. or, you know, he did pancakes once a month and it was a big deal. Um, you know, I cook every day. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, you know, he was working, you know, my mom took care of most of the you know, the child care kind of stuff, the diapers and the feedings and the this and the that. And, but that's something that I, you know, really shared kind of 50-50. And, um, you know, my dad was awesome at everything he was expected to do. Um, but, you know, I'm, I face a different set of expectations. And I think dads of our generation, you know, kind of face that, right? Where, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're still expected to do what dads have always done, but there's also more that we're expected to do. And that's why, it's, you know, it's a difficult time. Uh, you know, one of the quotes I have in the book from, um, I don't know if you, um, read anything by Michael Lewis. He's one of my favorite authors. Moneyball. Moneyball, blind yeah, side. Blindside, yep. Um, well, he wrote a memoir about fatherhood about, I don't know, 15 years ago or you now less than that. And, uh, but he said like, this is the, like, we're in the dark ages of fatherhood. Like dads of last generation, they knew what was expected of them. Dads of the next generation will know what's expected of them. But, you know, dads today like you know some of us look at us like we're super dads and other people look at us like we're complete slacker neanderthals who should help our wives more mm -hmm. and you know there's no like standard for what it means to be a good dad which again is one of the reasons why i um i wanted to write the working dad survival guide because um you know our role models our dads did it differently and i i think some you know i i think every dad i know cares a lot about their careers and work and being a good provider, but also really wants to be a hands-on involved dad. And, um, you know, that's a tough challenge. And uh, again, if we don't kind of, if we, not all of us have role models and see other people kind of succeeding in this, because the media sure doesn't show it, um, you know, it's important to get some advice and encouragement um, that we know we can be successful both 
you know, working and at home. Now, when you're busy uh, being a professor or when you're writing this book, uh, did you ever find that you were getting uh, too one-sided to the work side? Uh, like me personally? Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, yes, this this was, well, well, actually, you know, it turned out I got my book deal in December mm -hmm. and, um, you know, typically it takes well over a year to get a book turned around. Uh, but, you know, my publisher and I, we, when we talked, we were like, you know, we really want to get this book out by Father's Day, uh, which is insane. Um, but it meant I had to write the book in about two months. <laughs> and um, and I did uh, miraculously. And I did this with the Christmas and New Year's uh, in between. And, you know, I went skiing with my family over New Year's and, you know, we had holidays. And um, so I really tried to practice what I preached a little bit. <laughs> in terms of making sure to carve out time for, for life and family. But, you know, knowing that this was kind of a temporary thing, you know, it's going to be two months of pretty extreme work, you know, in addition to my regular job, um, you know, we were able to work around it. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's okay. I think most people who are ambitious in their careers, I think we all understand that, like, being occasionally overworked mm -hmm. is part of the deal. That's okay. Um, the problem is when you're chronically overworked, when every week is a 60, 70 hour week. Um, and that's when it really kind of eats into your time and to your energy and stuff like that. And, um, you know, it, it, this leads to another thing. You know, um, a lot of times when, when people think about work family balance, we think about like walking on a tightrope where if things aren't perfectly balanced, like everything falls apart. Um, that's not the best way to look at it. I, I think, um, you know, if we look at it like a balanced diet, you know, we know that, you know, we eat too much ice cream one week, we can make up for it by eating salads the next week. Mm -hmm. um, and this also, you know, and the same thing happens with work. Some some weeks, you know, are you got to be all in for work. Um, other times, you know, there's a family thing and you know, work has to go by the wayside and you have to pay attention to other things. And that's OK. Um, and also there's lots of different foods, right, to be healthy. Um, we also it's not just work and family. It's also taking care of ourselves. Um making sure we have time for us and our friends and for us as a couple and for ourselves and exercise and, you know, religion or whatever else you, uh, you know, uh, is an important part of your life. Now it's kind of weird because if a father, a man focuses too much on his work, he's considered a workaholic and he's yep. ignoring his family and whatnot. Or if there's, you know, too much family time and he's still professional colleagues will think he's you know just lazy oh uh, yeah. there goes dave again just taking off every uh night and weekend and not truly grinding he's not really committed to the cause now you talk about balance and it, it does seem like a tightrope at times but i feel like there once you get into a solid pattern of you know, balancing both it becomes just like a wide nice little breezeway you're walking down oh I like that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you can take that. Yeah, no, that's cool. I, I'll, I'll take the breezeway uh, metaphor. Um, yeah, no, I think you're right that, um, well, I, I think there's a couple things. One, you know, and, and this is where I start the book is, um, is with thinking through your priorities. What is it do you, that you want out of your career? And what do you want out of your family life? And what do you want out of your, you know, one crack at your kids' childhoods? And then start making decisions that, maybe get you there over time. Um, and we have to worry less about what other people think. I think, you know, that's a big problem, right? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, moms feel this more than dads, I think, where a lot of moms feel this pressure to be like the perfect mother or the perfect parent. And it's, it's nuts. Um, and, you know, dads feel the same kind of thing sometimes, especially in the workplace where it's not safe to kind of out yourself as like an involved father sometimes. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's, you know, kind of figuring out your own priorities and then, you know, assessing your situation. And, and that's what I try to do in, in the next part of the Working Dad Survival Guide is, you know, in the workplace, how can we navigate the workplace? How can we advocate for ourselves? How can we understand what opportunities might be there that we can work more flexibly uh, or what obstacles are in our way and what we can do about them? Um, because, you know, the, the fact is you can't, I hate that expression, you know, you can have it all, uh, because you can't, you know, um, we're adults, there are trade-offs. Um, you want to be a, you know, a, you know, the CEO of a company, you're not picking up your kids for tennis at 3.30. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, if you scale back your career, you're also, uh, you can't afford some of the things you'd, you'd otherwise be able to afford, and you have to be okay with those. 
Um, to be so a CEO and have a yacht or to be a senior VP and let your, and have your kids know your name. Right. I mean, but, and, and I think you summed it up really well. It, it, it's not the poor house or the penthouse, right? I mean, mm. I think it's, you know, w- what do we think our definition of success is, right, in our careers and in our family lives? Um, and then how do we work towards those? And I think that, you know, obviously, you know, listen, we have to earn money, right? So, you know, that's a constraint. And there's only mm-hmm. so much time, and that's a constraint. But, you know, I think, again, it might take you six months, two years, you know, to start, you know, working your way to, to where you want to go. But it could be just one or two quick changes that you make this week um, that make all the difference, too. Um, and I try to talk about both of those issues. Like, for example, this one guy, he found that – um his family time, his time with his family, everybody was just looking at their screens and not mm-hmm. really spending time together. Uh, yeah. Sure, we can all relate to this, right? Yep. Um, so he implemented um, no screen hours, six till eight at home for everybody. And at first his teenagers hated it and he hated it. Um, but it got them off the habit of being in front of their computers or holding their iPads or their phones. And for those two hours, they have to be together. Um, and now that's, that's like family time that they, they really uh, can use to bond. And, you know, that's a small little change um, that, that can make a big difference. Um, you know, other times it's bigger changes, maybe choosing a different career path or, uh, you know, trying to find an employer who's a little more flexible. Um, but sometimes it's like little things, too. Now, those are a couple examples from the book. Uh, what was your favorite story or you know, the guy who, in your opinion, had it most figured out? Well, wow. Um, well, my favorite story from the book might not be the guy who has it all figured out, but uh, my favorite story in the book is, um, you know, he's a guy, he, um, he's, he was a childhood friend of mine, and now he is like total high-flying executive at a major international financial firm. And he always put in 60, 70-hour weeks and still does. But when his daughter was very little, he felt like he was missing too much. Mm-hmm. And you know, so he, he really thought long and hard about his career, but before he did anything drastic, he just went to his boss, and people didn't really do this at his, his workplace then. He went to his boss and said, is there anything we could do about this? I have an idea. How about on Wednesdays, I come in at 1 o'clock, and, you know, I'll work into the night and everything, but I'll have the day. And he wound up having daddy-daughter Wednesdays with his, with his little girl. Yeah. Every Wednesday, he, it was just the two of them, every Wednesday for like three, four hours straight. Um, and that was one time during the week, all through her preschool years, that they had together. And for him, that made all the difference because now, you know, he feels very tight and connected with his daughter. Uh, but also, you know, he maintained his work reputation. You know, he, he he felt really nervous about just doing this kind of small accommodation to his work, to his work life. But the fact is, if you're a really good employee – most of the time you could get a little bit of slack and then people don't care as long as you continue to be a really good employee. Um, and, you know, so I think his story is great because of the, the family side, but it's also great because the work side that even if you're ambitious and want to have a big career, you can find kind of informal or smaller ways to just make sure you get enough family time. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, I'm telecommuting two days a week or I'm, you know, taking a big parental leave or anything like that. Sometimes it could be a smaller accommodation. So I really love that story. Um, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, it, it, actually one other story, if you, if you don't mind, yeah, um, fire. it was talking about like getting common interest with your kids because mm-hmm. family time can't just be, you know, being in the same room. It, it needs to be kind of like, Hey, how, what are we doing together? Right. Um, and this guy has two daughters, and they're totally like into princesses and stuff. And well, he's not. Yeah. Um, but his quote is, is like, I never thought I'd be the guy going to frozen on ice, but uh. you know, there I am because it makes them really happy and they mm-hmm. need this. And I need to get into their stuff at least somewhat, uh, in order to be with them and, and give them what they need. And, um, he did say that getting them into tennis and punk rock was going very well too, but oh, there you um, go. but you know you have to meet your kids where they are and and get interested at least in some of their interests so you you can have common interests. So like you said, it's it's not about having it all. There is compromises, and they're probably still a little too young for Breaking Bad or The Wire. Right. Uh, yeah. I mean, the the world would be better if kids didn't like watch Frozen a thousand times. <laughs> uh, I, I totally agree. 
I, I'm actually installing a frozen boycott uh, in our household. I don't know if the <laughs> wife will go for it. Uh, but all right, so let's hop into like the big hot button topic that you know, seems to come up, and it definitely hit close to home because uh, we just had our first daughter a month ago, oh. uh, and the wife uh, got. Congratulations, by the way. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, the wife got eight weeks of paid yeah. uh, m- maternity leave, and the United States is still so lacking, or I yep. say lacking, just behind the rest of the world as far as you know, maternity leave and also p- paternity leave is basically non-existent. What are your thoughts on that? Right. Well, we're one of two countries in the entire world um, who don't have some sort of mandated paid maternity leave, um, mm-hmm. the other being uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, so- oh. Economic powerhouse, Papa. Yeah, yeah. So listen, I mean, I I don't think we need to be kind of like a Northern European Swedish socialist welfare state, right? But Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's there's little reason we can't, you know, have similar policies to like the UK or Australia or Canada or Germany uh, in this regard, where at least there's a couple weeks uh, with with wage replacement uh, for people, uh, both moms and dads. Uh, You know, in terms of paternity leave, we're completely dependent on our employer for this. And uh, only about 14% of private employers have paid paternity leave, um, which I think is a real shame. Um, you know, I, um, I didn't really exactly have a paternity leave, but my son was born right after final exams in the spring semester, oh. uh, which is really nice. And nice. I just decided not to do, you know, I, I, I worked ahead so that I could have the summer. Um, and so I kind of got a paternity leave, you know, um, and it was really transformative for me. I, I had never changed a diaper or... Uh, <laughs> fed yeah. a baby before, um, and that stuff's actually not that hard once you kind of do it like ten, fifteen times, you know. Um, but you know, it's about bonding with my kid, but also my wife and I learning how to be parents together, um, so that like I felt very confident, she felt very confident in me, so she could take breaks. Doesn't have to all fall to her. We could really share, you know, um, in in being the primary parent. Uh, going forward. And, and that was really important for our family and setting up a really good dynamic that my wife can go back to work. Um, and, you know, she knows I have a cupboard or if I have to travel, I know she has a cupboard. And, um, you know, that that really started then with having paternity leave. But uh, but getting back to your initial question. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of companies will have, you know, a policy on the books for like two weeks or something like that. Um, so first off, my advice to dads is find out what your options are. Maybe your company has a policy that's just been sitting on a shelf somewhere. Um, and, you know, you may as well make them dust it off and be the pioneer and use it. Because uh, ultimately, your career is 40, 50 years long and two, three weeks isn't going to derail anything, um, you know, if we think about it long term. Um, but also, th- there's a couple other options. You know, if, if your company offers only maternity leave, you might legally have a right to at least some of that. Um, most maternity leave has two parts, Mm -hmm. uh, one for like physical recovery and then another for like care and bonding. Um, and if your employer's maternity leave is mostly care and bonding and not so much just recovery from childbirth and, oh my God, like, you know, thank goodness we don't have to go through that. Um, you know, uh, there is no reason, um, and in fact, they'd be discriminating based on gender um, if they don't offer, you know, that care and bonding part of the leave to also to um, adoptive parents and to new dads. Oh, uh, yes. So, you know, there's there's a lot. I mean, I hate to be in legislation mm-hmm. culture here or, or um, you know, legal lawsuit culture here, but there's been a lot of um movement legally on this where where dads are standing up for paternity leave so i think we're going to see some progress and we're seeing progress anyway so Um, you're saying this is the the first time like the the anti-sexism equality of the genders is working (laughs) in the man's favor yeah i um, baby yeah i mean maybe not the first time but yeah i mean this is something that um yeah that if you think about it um yeah uh, this this is a a place where you know when it comes to being supported as a father, this is something that society doesn't support uh, and you know um it, it's something that you know should be fairer i I, I completely agree um now, you were on the the CBS morning show after Mike Francesa you know, yeah you being a New York guy you know, it's obviously yep. close to home uh, when he had his thoughts about paternity leave being like what do you say a sham or a scam or something like it's that like a- 
what are you doing? The wife's taking care of everything. It's a vacation. And I'm like, well, no, it yeah, maybe for you. Uh, no, um, yeah, but what you're talking about, Daniel Murphy, who's on the Mets, um, was one of like about 130 now baseball players who have taken three day paternity leaves, uh, which is um, a policy that baseball has had since 2011. Mm -hmm. um, but he did it on opening day, and I guess it was slow news in New York. So, you know, Francesa and uh, Boomer Esiason actually uh, on his show kind of said similar things. And it became like this huge national media story, which was really weird to me. Uh, but the good news was most people like really supported Daniel Murphy uh, in this and said, no, this is important. You know, a couple of days is not too much to ask. Um, and, um, you know, so it actually it became a big story. But I, I think the, the good part was that most people started recognizing maybe for the first time that, hey, yeah, you know, dad should have at least a little bit of paternity leave. Well, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal since, uh, especially with baseball, it was early on in the season. But even if it was late in the season, the Mets probably wouldn't be contending anyways. Well, that, that's true, but but that's a little beside the point, right? <laughs> um, actually, you know, what, what's rather interesting is about later that season, um, the Brewers were in a the um, they were in the wild card chase towards the end of the season. And guess what? Ryan Braun, okay, who of course is not a good guy. Mm -hmm. um, took three day paternity leave during that stretch. And you know what? It was not a big national story and nobody like said much about it. Um, so it's rather interesting. Sometimes, you know, some stories get very big for so some weird reason and other stories get. Well, much if, if someone would have called Braun on it, he would just thrown the urine collector under the bus. He might again. have. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Yep. Uh, now what is a fatherhood network? Oh, okay. So, um, the, the, towards the end of the book, um, uh, of um, in the Working Dad Survival Guide, I, I have a section about taking care of yourself. And one big part of this, I think, is um, taking care of yourself socially. I know my wife is always, like, trying to kick me out of the house because, like, I don't get enough time out. And, and there are bad dads out there who, you know, you know, neglect their duties, but they're not listening to this podcast or reading my book. Um, so most of us, if we're working full time or more than full time and doing what we need to do as dads, we don't get a lot of social time. So one of the things I recommend is, you know, find some local dads who are in a similar situation to you and, um, and just get together every now and then. And, uh, so we have this tradition in my neighborhood, in my, my neighbor's yard, uh, we call it beer fire. Um, hey, I and, like the sound of yeah, that already. You know, and it's a little bit, you know, again, getting away from Frozen for a little while or mm -hmm. Bubble Guppies or whatever, tea parties. Um, getting together with some guys and we sit around like one of those backyard fire pit things with a cooler beer. And, you know, it's like once every month or so. And it's about 10 guys and we're all like from the neighborhoods so and most of our kids know each other. And, um, you know, basically we just hang out and it's good for social reasons, right? Just to hang out. But also it's, um, you know, yeah, we talk about sports and cars and, and, and women sometimes. But, you know, we're going to gravitate towards what we share in common, right? Which is, you know, hey, you know, this is what my job, you know, this is the frustration I have at my job right now. Or, oh, my God, this is happening with my kid. Or, you know, I had this conversation with my wife. And we, you know, um, not that it's a support group or anything. Um, mm -hmm. but Therapy. No, it, it's not group therapy, uh, but <laughs> it's just organically we're going to talk about the things that are common concerns. Um, so, you know, it's it's fun, it's relaxing, but we can also help each other a little bit. So I encourage my readers to to try to buddy up either at the workplace, you know, have a happy hour every couple of weeks with, you know, five to eight dads who are in a similar situation to you. Or if your neighborhood has a lot, you know, go for that. Um, if not, there are uh, city dads groups in 19 cities around the country. Um, you know, I also tell the story in the book of this one guy um, who he and a bunch of local dads, they go to the uh, opening night of all the superhero movies together. Um, ah, nice. And it, that's just their little tradition. And they call mm -hmm. themselves the dorky dads. I mean, that's their words. Um, so it doesn't have to be like super cool or anything, but it could be a poker night or going bowling or just making sure you have a little bit of social time that's a you know, the world, when you're a parent of young kids, especially, you can get, you know, um, I, I don't know, I don't want to say this too strongly, but it's a little bit of a feminized kind of world, right? Mm. Uh, you know, tea parties and diapers and, you know, soft blues and, and you know, 
you know, baby stuff, you know, uh, I think we need a little bit of a masculine counter programming sometimes. So what you're um, saying, Fight Club. Well, no. <laughs> um, wow, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm too much of a wimp for Fight Club myself. Well, no, no, no we can't talk about it. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> you, you know what the third rule of Fight Club is? What is that? Bring cupcakes. Oh, that w- that would make it a lot better. Yeah. To so be first rule, yeah. Okay. Anyway, but um, that's my lame Fight Club joke. Um, <laughs> but um, no. So I mean, but Fight Club came out of a need, right? For mm. um, whoever the the Ed Norton character to feel more alive and feel more like a man. Um, and I don't say we have to go that far, but um, you know, we want we don't want to blow up a city or anything, but um. But, you know, we, we need a little bit of a haven for ourselves and for our social needs. And I think it's OK to, to say, you know, listen, you know, it's like what they say on the airplane. You have to put your oxygen mask on, you know, and then you can help other people with theirs. Um, mm-hmm. And having some time with the guys, I think, is an important part of taking care of yourself so you can take care of other people. You ever seen the movie What to Expect When You're Expecting? No. <laughs> All right, so uh, there. Dear God, no! <laughs> it, it, it's one of the wife's favorite movies, and uh, I'll be honest. There's some entertaining parts, but there's a, a group of dads that get together. They're like a stroller mafia, and okay. it's led by Chris Rock. And okay. there's just like four or five dads that get together, and I think they're in Atlanta with the the giant park down there, and then they just walk. Now that, that's, you can tell it's kind of their support group, and then they. They they blow off steam about their wives. I think one of the dads, the kid's name is Henri, except he wants to call him Henry. That old right. thing. Okay. Except the wife insists on Henri. Gotcha. Yeah. Now, b- besides uh, like brick and mortar support groups of fellow dads, what are some other resources that uh, you know, working fathers can reach out to? Well, uh, and besides the book. Oh, besides my book. Um, yeah. Well, first off, my book, which you should buy <laughs> on Amazon.com, the Working Dad Survival Guide. Um, but uh, besides that, you know, that we're talking about this issue much more. I mean, you know, this podcast being, being one exhibit of this. Um, but I think, you know, we're finally recognizing a little bit that, you know, dads, um, you know, face a real challenge, a real tough challenge of providing and being good in our careers and also, you know, really wanting to be really involved dads. So there's a lot more out there. Um, I mentioned before the city dads groups. Um, I'm a member of the New York City uh, dads group. And I don't go to a ton of their stuff, but they have some dad's nights out, you know, happy hours and stuff like that just for dads. Mm -hmm. Um, They have some other things that are like for dads and kids, like they'll all meet up at a playground at a certain day and a certain time. Or um, they'll get like, you know, block of tickets to the latest Pixar movie for dads and their kids. Nice. Like that. And then also they have like these new dad boot camps where they get like uh, people who are about to become dads will go and but it's run by people who um dads of like one year or less kids um so the so the veteran dads just have young kids themselves and it's really just kind of talking about the transition to becoming a dad um you know usually the uh the veteran dads bring their babies and then they just have the other dads hold them uh during the sessions but they talk about things like work family balance and dealing with in-laws and dealing with you know maybe you know the wife kind of uh, pushing them out of the way and have, trying to do everything herself, which happens in a lot of families. Um, and, you know, and, and how to, you know, transition to fatherhood. So there's, there's a lot of that support. And there are 19 cities around the country. Um, I'm not sure if there's one in Minnesota uh, or in Minneapolis, but um, there, are, um, there are 19 different cities, so you could find them pretty easy um, if you live in one of these areas. Um, but... Um, you know, I would say, you know, the books by Armin Brott, um, you know, if you're really looking at the parenting side of it, um, he, he's really good about that. It's a relatable man-to-man advice. It's not what to expect when you're expecting or what to mm-hmm. expect the first year. Um, you know, and uh, but I think the most important thing to do for support is to talk about your own situation. You know, I mean, I know it's manly to be like strong and silent and to not admit that you struggle with something. But, you know, I think if we talk about this with some of our fellow dad friends or even talk about it with our wives or other people in our lives, um, you'll find that a lot of people are very sympathetic. Um, and, you know, um, you know, we, we there's a weird wall of silence around fatherhood and, and we need to kind of break that down. Uh, so it's not like the old way where you 
keep your feelings down and then you just smoke two packs a day and then you die of a heart attack at 45. Right. Well, we'd rather prevent that, right? Um, yeah. 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 So that's how yeah. daddy went. Right. I mean, we don't want to be, you know, we don't have to be like Phil Donahue or anything, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it's important to be like, you know, I mean, I'm, t you know, I, this is, I need to talk about this or I need to share ideas and strategies with somebody else. You know, maybe, you know, my dad, that guy around the corner I see at the bus stop, maybe he has an idea of how I could help limit screen time or, or what I should do about my son's allowance. Um, you know, so it could even be just be small things like that that, that make a big difference. Uh, now, in the last section of your book, you had a, a line that I really liked and uh, got paraphrased here, but it's uh, attention on working fathers is picking up speed. Now, how do you think the the landscape of how we approach working fathers and you know, for working mothers, for that matter, in, uh, let's say, a decade down the line? Well, I think, you know, there'll be huge progress. I mean, we're not having this conversation 10 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. So already just getting to this point is, is, is really progress. But the thing is, I, I've seen, uh, again, I participated in this, this thing last summer called the White House Summit for Working Families. And um, there were CEOs of major companies, male CEOs, talking about, first off, their own work family challenges. And secondly, how they're starting to try to get their their companies to, to move on this and you know a lot of really big companies and ones you wouldn't expect like goldman sachs and bank of america and you know ernst and young and and you know you know these very high pressure workplaces they're really struggling with this because they're losing so many good employees when they get to their prime parenting years in the, like their mid-30s well, i mean yeah taking government bailout money it takes a lot of work hours <laughs> take some time away from the kiddos yeah but um but anyway but but you know, the the rank and file employees who are putting in mm -hmm. the 65 hour weeks that they're figuring out hey you know i've been working at bank of america and i'm working my butt off but now i don't have enough time to be a good dad so i'm gonna find you know still a good job but you know something else that doesn't require travel and 70 hour weeks so these big companies are are they're not doing it to be nice, but they're figuring out they're losing too many good people. Um, so a lot of them have really started implementing really good policies around workplace flexibility, about paternity leave. And, um, you know, so there's progress. Um, I think that, you know, we're going to see, uh, you know, um, there's much more equality in terms of women in the workplace. And I think, you know, the only way we're really going to get equality in the workplace is if we get equality at home, too. And we respect dads as much as we respect moms and give them as much credit and and uh, recognition a, as moms get. So, um, uh, you know, so, so that'll change. I mean, the fact is most PTAs, which used to be 95 percent women, are now about 75 percent women. Um, you know, so things are changing slowly. Um, and, you know, um, listen, I I just think. I'd rather see both men and women be able to really live their priorities more. And mm -hmm. whether that means, you know, a very career driven woman, that's awesome. If it's a very uh, family oriented guy, that's great. Um, if someone has more traditional priorities, that's awesome too. Um, just, you know, as long as we understand uh, where we are. The, the trick is too many of us drift through life, right? Like we, we got on a path 20 years ago or 15 years ago out of college with our careers and then we don't think about it anymore and our career might not fit our family life um, 15 years down the road, but we stay with it because we don't think about it. And mm -hmm. um, if the one lesson I hope people get from the working debt survival guide really is don't drift, make conscious choices, you know, really think through like, what do I want? You know, what are, what are my kids need? And you know what? Your kids need time with you probably more than they need yet another video game or yet another thing that'll get thrown away. Um, and, you know, what do I want out of life? Do I want to, you know, again, smoke two packs a day and die early of a heart attack because I'm so stressed out at work? American dream. Or do I want, you know, a more well-balanced life? And mm -hmm. whatever you decide is fine. Um, but, you know, making conscious choices is, is the important part. And what I really try to do in the book is, uh, again, have people think through their priorities and I kind of guide them through some self-assessment exercises and then think about the workplace and where you are and think about your home life and where you are and how can you make some of those decisions that can lead you to a life that's that's kind of more balanced. Uh, beautiful. And, and just to you know, bring it home on, on a personal note, 
Uh, you know, the wife and I had this discussion when we were uh, expecting our first child. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I work from home. I'm independent. Uh, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. have you know, a bunch of, of ventures, irons in the fire. And uh, the wife works uh, out of the home. Mm-hmm. And I'm actually going to be a stay-at-home father for uh, the first couple of years until uh, the daughter goes off to right. uh, preschool and stuff. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And it's a time that you know my job flexibility is at a place where uh, I have the freedom where I, I can make that choice because yeah. I know, you know a lot of young fathers that are you know my friends and my peers you know, don't really have that since they're they're stuck working a nine to five and it, it's it came down to a conscious decision where it's like I, I can kind of ease back a little bit when she's young but you know when she gets older and the other kids get older uh, you know out of high school or out of the nest even then you can really start picking the ball back up again because. Yeah, that's the beautiful thing about being independent. Yeah, and you know, I, I think that's really wise. And um, the other thing is, careers are really long. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think sometimes people forget that. You know, like and there's a lot of X. Yeah, exactly. And it's like you know, you could slow down for a few years, as you, as you're you're talking about, or or shift how you work for a few years, and then you know, maybe you don't get exactly back on the same track that you did before, but. Um, I, I think you're thinking through it and you're making conscious choices and that, and that, that, that's really the, the big step, you know, just to relate my personal story. Um, again, I, I kind of have this cushy job as a college professor and, um, my wife is a theater actress, um, mm-hmm. in New York city. And so she works evenings and weekends when she has a show, when she's rehearsing, it's like 12 hours a day. And when there's an audition, it's tomorrow at 11 and you have to be there. Uh, it can't get rescheduled. So she has much less control over her time. Um, so we've relied really on my work flexibility, kind of like what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's really hard, especially when kids are young. But, you know, I look back and I'm like, wow, I had this great opportunity that most dads don't get, you know. Um, and so it, it's really been a gift to me to be able to be as involved a dad as I've been. And um, I really wish that my wish for dads is that, um, you know, every dad can feel like, you know, they've been really involved through their kids' lives. And that mm-hmm. takes different shapes for every family. But, you know, to look back uh, on your kid's childhood and know that they know that you were there and you were a fun, loving presence in their lives, um, you know, that's really what we want. Like my bottom line was like when she's out of school for the summer and she'll be like, hey, you want to go to a ball game today on a yeah. Tuesday? I'll, I'll be like, okay. Yeah. Afternoon game. Let's go. Yeah. No, that's, that's, you're, you're right. You're right on it, man. Beautiful. Uh, Scott, what's your next book? Ha. Um, <laughs> 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 you know, after this year, the, the book has been all consuming. I can't even think about that at the moment. No, but mm-hmm. um, I think my next book would be written for supervisors and managers on, on kind of managing work family um, issues uh, from their point of view. So how do you um, set up a workplace that could be flexible, uh, but you still kind of know what people are doing, um, you know, and, and how you can uh, work with your employees to help them meet their family needs, but also be, you know, a, again, really productive employees. Because you got to think as uh, awareness for uh, working dads is progressing that uh, workplaces that recognize it and give flexibility and leeway are going to be way more attractive than the old standard old boy rigid network, right? Absolutely. And the the evidence is getting there. And most companies, most big companies get it. Mm -hmm. Like they understand, hey, this is important. We're going to lose, you know, we're better able to attract and hold on to really good people if we offer these things and become a more family friendly employer. They recognize it. Now they don't know exactly how to implement it. But so that's where they are right now. They kind of like they recognize this is an important issue. Uh, we're starting to grapple with it, but th- they're not quite there yet. Um, and in fact, one of the things that that has come from from this book is that um, I've been able to work in um, a handful of companies already, um, and I, I've had a couple of workshops with managers and employees about you know how do we move from awareness to like doing something about it. All right. Now, last two to close it out. Now, your son is a, a gymnast. Are yeah. you and the wife already saving for an Olympic trip down the oh, line? Oh God, I hope not. I mean, I'm, honestly, um, I, I I love my son. He's so into it. He's really good at it. Mm. Um, which you know, I, I don't want to sound braggy, but you know, it's nice when a kid can do something and get real self-esteem from it because it's not like, yay, everybody gets a trophy. 
Um, but the thing is, it's starting to take over my life. And, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, you know, uh, they said this summer, if he wants to stay on track, it has to go three days a week. Uh, there you go. Two hours, you know, so six hours of instruction a week. But it's like, you know, an hour there and back. Um, so now we're looking at nine hours a week on this and, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I want to support him. Um, but I also want to make sure it's more important for me that he has a normal childhood <laughs> and has friends and interests than that he gets on a Wheaties box or something one day. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll have to make some decisions at some point because I'm not willing to, you know, have my son's entire, you know, childhood and teenage years taken over by one thing. Now, see, oh. that, that's a healthy attitude to have, whereas you know that a good chunk of the parents at the gymnastics uh, class or school are like, it's happening. Olympics 2024. Come on, baby. Yeah, yeah. No, um, yeah. Uh, again, yes. I Just I, keep cutting those checks. Third mortgage. Let's go. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. Gymnastics is not cheap, so... Um... <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's crazy because there's like very little equipment besides like the actual gymnastics equipment. You know I mean, it's not like football or hockey. That's true. There's not a lot of personal equipment, but the yeah. equipment is expensive. And then also, you know, traveling to tournaments and stuff is, uh, gets pricey, but yeah, there's not a lot of personal equipment. Although the uniforms, I was shocked by how much they charge us for uniforms. So, Ugh, you know, they, they get the, know. which, which I was, I was like, no, come on, we pay enough here. You know, but I guess not. Also, you know, it's funny. The gym is um, in this very, um, it's funny. It's in this little industrial park tucked away by a, a train line, but it's in Chappaqua, New York, mm-hmm. um, which is very like hoity-toity rich Westchester. Um, in fact, the Clintons have their house in Chappaqua. Um, and we're not those people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're driving from a very, you know, a, you know, a, a very different kind of place. Uh, to get to this gym. But I think a lot of the rest of the clientele there are just, you know, richer people for whom, you know, money is not really an object. And um, that's not us. I mean, you know, we're, I mean, I make a nice salary. My wife, you know, gets good gigs and all, but um, you know, it's, so it's something you're we pulling have to up in the about. Toyota with the parking lot full of Audis. Yeah, that's kind of what it is. Yeah. Uh, and of course there are these Audi, um, you know, sport utility vehicles, the giant ones that take up like two parking spots and everything. So, um, oh, yeah. yeah, which kind of annoy me, but anyway, <laughs> all right. Uh, last one, then we'll get you out of here. Giants or jets. I'm a jets fan. Unfortunately, yeah. I chose poorly, um, as a child. <laughs> now, have you impressed this uh, upon your son? No. In fact, it's funny. He's my son is, and has to be a, um, a New York sports fan. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, so I'm a Knicks fan and a Yankees fan as well. And, you know, my son is on board with those. But I told him he could choose his own football team as long as it's not the Patriots or Dolphins. Because <laughs> I do not want to inflict Jets fandom uh, on him. Uh, you know, in a couple of years, he'll get that rebellious teenage phase. He'll, he'll show up in a, a Celtics jersey, a uh, 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 Patriots hat, and, uh, I don't know, some sort of Red Sox parka. Well, it's funny. My in-laws are all from Boston. and Oh, so we have these arguments all the time. Um, they like when he was little, they would buy him like Patriots onesies, and I'm like, he's not wearing this, you know. And um, uh, he's as a, as a spit bib. Yes, yeah, exactly. But um, you know, it's funny, and um, you know, the whole Deflate Gate thing has been uh, a point of consternation with my in laws. <laughs> it, it, it's finally good that you can goose him on something. Yeah, you know, they're um, the, the level of success the Patriots have had is, is, uh, is really something, but it, you know, it's funny cause I'm not even a hardliner on it. I mean, listen, it, whatever's bad for the Patriots, I'm, I'm happy about, but you know, I really think the league went, um, you know, considerably overboard, uh, yep. w- with this whole thing. And, and I even told them that, but that's not good enough to satisfy them. They're like, no, we need to clear Tom Brady's name and we need to sue the NFL. And Tom Brady is the greatest person who's ever lived. And I'm like, you know, calm down people. He's just a man, you know? <laughs> Well, hopefully Gino can step it up for you this year. Oh God, um, you know I really think <laughs> that you know Buffalo and uh, and the Jets, if they just had a league average quarterback, they'd be fantastic teams. Um, I think Minnesota's getting there. I think you know Bridgewater's 
Oh, we love Teddy here. I think oh Teddy's turning into a, a really good quarterback. And, uh, you know, I think we have the rest of the team. We just don't have the quarterback. Uh, well, I, I think after the Christian Ponda era, we were kind of owed one. Yeah, and... you really went through a tough uh, stretch of uh, QB play there. <laughs> yeah. All right, so that's wrapping up NFL talk. Uh, Scott, hey, thank you so much uh, for coming on the Dad Mode podcast. And uh, thanks for dropping knowledge. Uh, the book is The Working Dad Survival Guide, How to Succeed at Work and at Home. Get it on Amazon. It'll all be in the show notes. The blog is fathersworkandfamily.com. Uh, Dr. Scott Beeson, at Scott Beeson, uh, B-E-H-S-O-N, on the Twitter machine. Hey, thank you so much. All right. Thank you, man. And like we mentioned, the Working Dad Survival Guide, How to Succeed at Work and at Home, available on Amazon. And you know what you can do to help both Scott and myself out? Click on the Dad Mode's Amazon link, top left corner of dadmodepod.com. It will take you to Amazon through our link, bookmark that, and just order everything you want. All of the Scott Beeson books that you want, and uh, maybe a couple more expensive items. Maybe a couple Xboxes or a couple, I don't know, what are the kids playing nowadays? PlayStation 9s? Something like that. Or some iPads. Order some high-end stuff that you're going to buy anyways through our Amazon link, and uh, we'll get a little taste. The Dad Mode ship will keep on going forward but uh, we're out here shows available itunes youtube stitcher uh, pretty much everywhere and follow me on twitter at dadmodepod or my personal account at andy carlson show the website dadmodepod.com be a man be a father go dad mode see you next time think the episode you just heard is worth a dollar well send it our way Visit dadmodepod.com slash support to find out how. Be a man. Be a father. Go dad mode. The music is created and produced by Deeb. To hear more of his tracks, visit soundcloud.com slash Deeb.